time you put your hands in the snow, not with the gloves, with bare hands. Probably your mom told you, oh, it's going to be cold. But you did it. It was cold. And then perhaps you put your hand even deeper or longer into the snow. And after a certain time, you had like pain. And then this pain was your kind of limit. And as an explorer, what I like to do is to try to reach limits. Sometimes I go on expeditions very hard, very solo, or with friends. And here you see me and Gadiel Sanchez. Uh, Gadiel is a specialist from Peru uh, in the jungle. He's been walking along the Amazon River for two years straight. And I think he had the capacities mentally to follow me. Uh, also, when I asked him uh, about Lake Titicaca, which is also, of course, part in Peru, he said, yeah, I, I think I know where it is. Um, I've never been on altitude. Uh, I've never been really in cold. I don't know what is ice. I've never been in a kayak. I'm not sure what is a kayak, but I'm motivated. I said, well, yeah, you're in. You can join me. Good. So how did we prepare? We prepared during two or three days in the Bay of Puno on Lake Titicaca. And I, had, I was very close to him to check that he didn't fall into the water, because in the Bay of Puno, there's a lot of trash, real pee, -pee and caca from, in, from the town. And this is what we did. So Titicaca expedition, the Titicaya, sorry, <laughs> expedition, we finished six months ago, uh, starting in Puno, Puno uh, anti-clockwise, following the shore of the lake. Good thing with Gadiel when I asked him just before leaving, by the way, can you swim? He said, uh, yeah, but if we, we have to fall not too far from the shore. Okay, we'll try to do that if you fall in the water. So we were hosted on a boat. We prepared our gear, our kayaks, food, and everything we needed for the expedition with at least three weeks of supplies of food. And on the very first day, after four hours, we got already lost on the lake. Why? Because when I looked at my maps, and my GPS, I say, oh, we are supposed to be in the water. And as you can see here, we were already on land. What's happening? Things have been changing from the maps of the 70s, of course. And we climbed a little bit higher. And this is what we saw. So the part you see on this photo, the right part is Lake Titicaca. The left part was part of Lake Titicaca with a dam that is actually sacrificed. So the pee, -pee in the caca goes into the part of the lake and doesn't damage too much the Bay of Puno, but only for half of town. The other half still goes into the lake. There's a lot of pollution in there. So on that very first night, we followed the coast and we passed along totoa plants. These are reeds. So where you are in a kayak like this, you have the reeds about this height, so you don't see very well. So what happened is that when it was kind of getting dark, we said, OK, we have to find a shore. And we found the passage you see on the photo, found someone, say, hey, is this your land? Yes. Can we sleep there? Yes. What are you doing? And we explained what we were doing. And of course, we had a lot of fun. We saw nice scenery. We had uh, a lot of good weather uh, and sun because we were doing it in the winter. The thing is that in the winter, it's a bit cold, so you don't really want to fall into the water. We were two men on a mission. Not only we wanted to paddle around the lake, but I want to film, I wanted to take photographs to document the lake because no one has actually followed the coast. We didn't know uh, what was around certain parts of the lake. It was not explored fully. Uh, yeah. So we had uh, beautiful weather, clear water sometimes, and this is what we call the sopa, so the soup. It was like really hard to paddle in there. You had to level up your paddle, and you had like lots of plants. And we were about doing one kilometer per hour in this, very close to the shore. Sometimes it took us about two hours to do one kilometer in, in there. Um, it's a kind of fun. Sometimes we made competitions <laughs> for, for the fastest idiot to go in the sopa. We met people along the way who encouraged us, who were also very curious. So we are, we are having, of course, different clothes than them because they're kayak clothes. They, most of the people had never seen a kayak before. They were curious. So the kayak was the way to engage conversation with them, talk about the experience about the lake, how polluted is it, how do they live, uh, is the level of water moving up and down through the rain season and evaporation of the lake. And we paddled long times per day. Started mainly from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. It was already dark because it's winter. And sometimes we were paddling along cliffs. 
and sometimes you battle for three hours along cliffs because you have no way to stop. So you have to stop where there's at least a beach or something where you could stop. But we manage even through the darkness, even if sometimes we missed each other for like half an hour, we didn't even see each other. And of course we camped where we could, having fun each in our own small tent. My tent was 200 euro, his tent was $20. So when it rained, he was completely drenched. That's why we bought a canvas, so he could put a canvas on his tent where we got some rain, storms, and sometimes, of course, thunder. Uh, going forward on the lake, we m managed to meet more interesting people. This is perhaps the oldest man we met on the river. He was about uh, 70 years old. He didn't really know his age anymore, but he, he was around that. And I asked him if I could take a photo of him. And it was like one of the first times someone took a photo of him. So he's like, okay, I have to be really, really proud. That was his way of being proud to be on the photograph. And he told us that along the years, the level of, of water has been uh, sinking and getting lower, which means less coast for us, but of course, uh, the, the coastline that was in the water becomes mud and it's harder to access the water when you have to walk into the mud. We met a few friends um, who actually were friends of Belgians who made their own kayak made of fiberglass. The Karachi Explorer is one of the, these boats, so fiberglass, but they still weighed about 35 kilograms in the water. We did half a day together having good fun. Oops, going too fast. And one morning, uh, when we went to bed at night, we didn't see where we were exactly. And in the morning, when we woke up, this was uh, a beach with all this trash all over the place. Plastic bags, bottles, uh, tires, old bicycles, everything. Like we have sometimes here also in Europe or anywhere else on the planet. So the lake is in danger because of the trash of the people that are not aware yet of the damage of plastic can do. Plastic is also in the water. And I've been very fortunate to go... Oh, no, sorry. So plastic is in the water, and you, only, uh, you also find in water frogs. The largest freshwater frog of the planet is in Lake Titicaca. It's endangered. It's endangered. And this is Arturo. Arturo is married with a Belgian uh, woman. He lives in half of the time in Ghent. The other half of the time, he's in... Um, uh, Bolivia, studying the plant. So I was also very fortunate to go scuba diving, seeing the frogs, and meeting the Bolivian army who said that. I said, Bolivia, yes, we had to pass the border of Bolivia, which, which was very hard because we lost two days of paperwork because the police didn't know what was a kayak. They thought we had uh, perhaps drugs with us. So it was a full tour of interrogation and paperwork. But we managed to do it. Eating. Well, where we could beach, we beach and we ate, or we ate um, on the water. This was a place where you see the mountains behind are 15 kilometers away, and there's a lot of totora plants all over. So it was really, really hard to get through it. It was like a labyrinth, so we didn't reach actually this part of the lake on the coast to measure it. Sometimes you had to follow people who spoke Aymara, so not Spanish. So they were going somewhere, we didn't know where, but we just followed and we managed to, to pass. Uh, this is a totora cutter, so he cuts the totora plant, and it helps him to, um, to feed the animals. Uh, this is what they do. So we visited a few schools along the way who were, of course, curious about what we were doing. And we loved, in Bolivia, the, the nice mountains that were behind us. And uh, guess where I am? Okay, that's an easy question. And we had a, a good evening and meeting in the morning with these people that when I said goodbye, I said, Gadiel, where are you? And he was still with them, saying, hey, you have to come with me. He, he felt like, good, we still have a, a few kilometers to go. And on the very last day, we had the very luck to sleep on one of the uh, Uros floating islands. A really great experience to sleep with these people. We even met the school. And Gadiel is, is here very uh, laughing a lot, because actually, if you see in the boat, uh, this is like the school bus, and the one whose paddle is actually the, 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 the smallest child. He's six years old, all the others are like 12, 13. And we're laughing that they, they made the little boy rowing. Uh, other people go on SUP, standard paddle, to school as well. And this is the kind of points we were taking with the GPS 
And how we did that? Well, we were going into the Torah, very hard places, because we tried to have a point every kilometer or so, or getting very dangerous close to the rocks, uh, being scared that the wave would push us uh, against the rocks. And this is what we did. 1,000 points, 1,500 photos of the lake, creating actually the first street view of the lake, the first photographic inventory on, the, on Lake Titicaca. Why, we do want to do, why did I want to do that? Well, if we can compare the future of the lake like we do with glaciers, this is information, this is a way to know more about the lake itself and its evolution and to be less naked. Uh, also said about the water level, this is not what's really happened, but this is what would happen if there's too much evaporation due to climate change. So the part of the lake in Bolivia can completely disappear. Imagine the impact on the Bolivian people of this part of the lake. And we were really happy and proud to be carrying the Explorers Club uh, flag. And if you want to know more and see the inventory, you can scan that or you can go on my websites and see all the other expeditions. And being naked, I'm really happy that this is not snow, but I'm perhaps the first person to touch this red carpet of TEDx Flanders. Thank you.